Hi, my name is Brenda, and I'm a faculty librarian. And on behalf of Regent University and the library, I would like to welcome you to our wonderful reception, our gratitude reception for Keith Gooding. This is a wonderful painting, God-given, anointed, and we are so blessed to have him here to speak with you today. Keith has over 20 years of experience in painting and plus more. And so I am so excited to introduce him right now to all of you. Keith Gooden. Thank you, it's good to be here tonight. I'm so excited to be here. We're from Florida. Uh, the, the, the weather is beautiful. We want to take this back with us, but I don't think that we can. <laughs> uh, first of all, let's, let me uh, uh, say thank you to every one of you that have participated in this, getting this painting here. Uh, it hasn't been that hard, but uh, it's, there has been a couple of bumps along the way. And so we appreciate your time and efforts in, in that. Um, what I enjoy about this piece is the fact that we are entering into a new era, should I say, in the church. And I believe that what is exciting to me is, is to be able to see, could I get that music just down a little bit? I love that music. I just can't, <laughs> unless you want me to sing. <laughs> I don't think so. And what I'm excited about is this new reformation, this new renaissance that we're about to enter into in, in the arts. I believe that we have in the 15th century that there was a, uh, an amazing touch by God on the artisans of that time, um, both in music, um, in dance, and in paintings. And so I'm excited to be able to be a part of what God is doing today. In 1993, I had a vision and a, a dream, and it's sort of like a Jacob dream or a J Jacob vision. And in this dream, I was, I was walking down a cobblestone street in Italy. And as I was walking down this cobblestone street, I was approached by a man that came out of the side of the, 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 uh, one of the doors. And as he came up to me, he said, are you Keith? I said, yes. And so I, as I began to dialogue with him, he handed me a golden brush in my hand. Uh, and he gave me, and I reached out and grabbed it with my hand. And as I did, I felt like God began to speak to me. And he said, just like the 15th century was breezed, as I breezed upon the artisans of the 15th century, so too will you carry the anointing uh, for this generation and this century. And so as I begin to go about along this, tra uh, this, this, this trail and this discovery for the last 20 years, I begin to know other artisans that have had the same kind of vision, the same kind of dream, to be able to bring the glory of God back to the church. And it's exciting for me to be 40 years old, 20 years from that dream, and say, God, look what you have done, and just give him the credit for that. And so as I, I just got back from Rome uh, uh, several weeks back and seeing these paintings that were painted 500 years ago, they still echo through eternity today. And so it's amazing for me, and, and the inspiration behind that came through the, uh, this time period. It's sort of the Renaissance period, the, bar the Baroque period, so you'll see that this painting is, has that same similar style from that time period, in which I'm very, um, uh, some of my f most famous artists are Michelangelo, uh, Titian, and, and Rembrandt, and, and, and others that you may know in textbook. But to actually see their work up close was absolutely spellbounding and mesmerizing for me. And so as I started this uh, two years ago, I, I began to feel the, the Spirit t tell me to paint something large. And he would begin to show me and tell me what he wanted, wanted me to paint as I began to paint this. So two years ago, I just had this word, light of the world, come to me. And so... I began to listen to the Spirit of God, and it didn't, I didn't know that two years later I'd be painting it. But last year, about July, I started this piece. Now, this is one complete canvas. It is a 12-ounce cotton duct artistic canvas. It was uh, uh, hand uh, uh, done out of New York City. Um, and I brought it to my studio in Florida, and we have about half of, the studio, half of this room here is my studio, so it's rather large. 
And so we're, I was able to stretch this on this, uh, uh, one of the largest stretchers I've ever seen that we built. <laughs> but uh, on this, so that you guys can tell, one complete canvas, we, and then I sized it, and then three uh, coats of gesso on it. But little did I know that the first day I started, God just began to tell me, I want you to focus on Christ. I want you to focus on the time, pla the, the, the birth of Christ, the place where it all came, the prophetic words all begin to point towards in, throughout the Old Testament and the scriptures. So as we can see, we see Mary and Joseph here, very iconic in our society today and throughout history as artists begin to portray uh, the nativity scene through Mary and Joseph. But what's interesting about this particular piece is that Joseph is the only one that's looking at you. He's the only one offering you the invitation to the light of the world. So I started with this, and this is all I started with. And everything else was white and blank. So it was kind of intimidating waking up every morning wondering if I'm going to have enough canvas at the end by the time I paint this. Not knowing how long I'm going to be able, how long I'm going to be able to paint this, or I had a deadline by Christmas, of course, of last year, because we had a, to present this in Christmas time. So every day, uh, for about 12 hours a day, 12 to 14 hours my day, the day, I would paint and paint for about four to five months. So it was intensive, very long, and I had to kind of really rely on the Spirit of God because every day He would begin to show me something new, something fresh. And so you can see here, he's extending his hand out. And um, what's interesting about this, I'll tell you now, that when, you get th when I finish here, you can stand right here, and you can look at his hand and his face. And as you walk by and, uh, by and look at him like this, he will actually move his hand and move his face and follow you. And he will, he's the only one that does that in this particular piece. So that's a little trade secret that artists use. And uh, so he's offering the light of the world to you. Um, so I'll start this way. Uh, I actually started from here, and I worked around here. So you can see actually in the, in the back here, as I was sitting there one day, the, the scripture came to me um, that we were to preach the gospel to all nations. And so you can see the nations in the back of the, the rock here. And that was, I just started to see that that the continent of Africa fit snugly between their two shoulders, the shoulders of Mary and Joseph. And as you worked my, my way over here, I, I began to see the lion appear out of this area, sort of a C.S. Lewis kind of vision of what he saw, the lion of the tribe of Judah mentioned in Revelation. And if you notice, there is a, there's a, it's sort of a heartbeat, and the heartbeat of a lion. And that's where it is coming from there, and it's going right to the heart of the Christ. So Jesus having the heartbeat of a lion. And if you move on up, you can actually see, I, I, this is, a lot of people have talked to me about it, that, it's, that the, the saddle is the uh, United States is seated on the lion. I, I, I didn't mean that for any political reason whatsoever. <laughs> so uh, I move on up here, and you can see the angel that is uh, overseeing the birth, that is heralding, that is, that is um, kind of uh, offering you the invitation and telling you the humanity about, you know, that, that night that he approached the, 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 the shepherd, shepherds in the field. Of course, we have the day star mentioned there. Now, let me just stay, start by saying that my first scripture started in Isaiah, Isaiah 63 and 64. This is the Isaiah of the prophet here. This is where I, I got the inspiration to do this prophetic in, in, vision. And so you can see him with his scrolls. He's kind of looking into his prophetic vision, and it's almost as if he is almost fulfilled and satisfied that what he spoke has come to pass. And so what we see here is a timeless piece demonstrated of the nativity. A lot of the uh, nativity scenes in the 15th century, when they were interpreted, they were interpreted in that time period only. If you can look and you can see different elements of today that are involved. So it's a timeless piece of generations from the past to this day to the future. Um, as we move on up through here, um, it actually, I started back over here on this side. If you notice here, a lot of our uh, contemporary pageantries today have sort of uh, demonstrate um, uh, plays about the nativity. And so what's interesting about this, if you notice, the young girl here, her jeans are kind of exposed. 
uh, and representing sort of a modern day kind of approach which uh, has a thematic, <laughs> thematic theme to it uh, for, for a pageantry of the, of the nativity scene. And so she's offering a uh, crimson uh, a robe here to the, the, the Christ representing his blood. And you also notice that it's frayed and it's not finished. So it's like silk. Uh, does this need a battery or something? I don't, I don't know. Is it okay? You're okay? All right. And so we notice also sort of a same thing, Prince Caspi, and if whatever you would like to interpret it of. But we also, it's also bringing the, cr the crown, mentioned in Revelation, where we all will lay our crowns at his feet. And so it represents that. Of course, this has symbolic meanings. Of course, the sp sword of the spirit representing the word becoming flesh. Uh, so all these different elements have different com meanings and components to the scripture. As we move up, this is my wife. And this is my young one, my wife back there in the back in the white. So <laughs> I had her pose for 12 hours straight, standing like this. Just kidding. She <laughs> but my young one would never do that, so I had to take photos. <laughs> so this is my youngest daughter here. Uh, of course, the artists have always got to paint that, you know. So, uh, of course, this is a self-portrait of me, the camel here. And anyway, just kidding. And, uh, but this is one of my good friends here. All these people are pretty much good friends. They were all, you know, it was the highest bidder that would get into this, right? So, um, of course, the wise, wise man in, in the pageantries mentioned in the scriptures as well. Uh, and then we see a processional of people coming to bring their, their lights to, to the Christ to represent them being the, the, the scriptures that say, I, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I wish you would all become children of that light. Well, this is a, a, another scripture that bases itself on this particular painting. So we move on down here. Uh, we, rep we see different cultures, different multicultural generations coming to that one moment in time uh, to see the, the Christ uh, for themselves, because we all come to, to see that Christ came to die for us, but he also was born of a virgin, and we all have to recognize that, because that's a major key in our salvation. Um, we, uh, oh, the young girl here, uh, represents in Matthew 11, talking about, Jesus says that, I, you know, I uh, do not let the children, uh, suffer the children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. And so you notice that she is the closest one to, besides Mary, to the Christ in this particular picture. Uh, she also bringing the lamb, which is a sacrificial lamb mentioned um, also in the scriptures. Um, also, uh, guess who this guy is? Anybody? Be uh, John the Baptist. Okay. Dressed burly and in, in, the, in the kind of a... That's kind of my interpretation. Actually, this is a guy that's a friend of mine, so he's a biker of all things. Could you imagine? Uh, but uh, he actually posed for me in this one. Uh, but what's interesting about this particular uh, John the Baptist is I took it out of Matthew 11, the first, the first part of that chapter, which talks about G Jesus actually called um, John the Baptist, he called him the greatest prophet of all. Now, here is the greatest prophet of all, mentioned in chapter 11, Matthew 11, sorry, and he is in prison. And in prison, he's questioning whether this is the Christ or should he be looking somewhere else. Now, Jesus just got through calling him the greatest prophet of all, but yet he's mentioned in the, and sitting in jail, and he's contemplating and questioning that. So you, do, you see that he is the only one besides... But, sorry. Is it okay? But can you hear me okay? A little bit? Okay. But if you notice that uh, John Baptist is the only one besides this guy here, and, and uh, I'm sorry, this one here, that is actually not looking at the Christ himself. Now John the Baptist is actually looking off and saying two things that he could probably be saying. One thing, okay, intermission's over with you, come back. Okay, so as you can see, John the Baptist mentioned in Matthew chapter uh, 11, in the first part, he's sitting in jail, and he's kind of wondering if this is a Christ or should we look for someone else. Now, there's two questions that he could be looking at here. He could say, remember when he was in, in the wilderness and he said, this is the Christ, and this is the one that I should be baptizing, and, you know, he should be taking, I should be taking 
off my sandals. And so John the Baptist is saying, look, he is the Christ. This is the one. Or is he saying, is this the Christ or should we be looking somewhere else? These are the two questions that we as, as uh, Christians and believers begin to ask ourselves about the gospel. Is this the gospel? Is it the truth or should we, look, we be looking somewhere else? And so we can see here that they are conversing with one another. Now, David is, is right here, of course. He's taking off his priestly garments and he's putting it over his shoulder, recognizing his, his humbling himself before the Christ. Uh, also as the shepherd, the shepherd's rod. And then right beside him, of course, David being also a, a psalmist, a worshiper, where we get a lot of our, our uh, worship songs from. Um, this is representing the modern day worshiper with the modern day guitar and um, the modern day worshiper. Now he is actually singing um, and also being distracted by John the Baptist, of course. And above John the Baptist to the left is the judge representing the, the kingdom of God. The government of God is upon his shoulders. So that's representing the, the, uh, the law, representing the, the different thing, the elements of the kingdom of God. Uh, we go on, we can see multicultural generations here. Uh, we also see uh, a military U.S. soldier here. Um, always the charge, uh, the patch is always, the stars are always facing forward, representing the charge into battle. Uh, this represents our charge into the finishing line that Paul talks about. Um, and also you can see the wheat here um, is actually bowing towards the Christ, representing the harvest. And out of the harvest you see people coming from all nations, all tribes, all, di all different parts. And what's interesting about this area here is that uh, during I was painting that, there was a uh, California fires. And in California fires, uh, they were glistening over the hills, and there was fires, and so it kind of inspired me. And I said, man, wouldn't that be neat if it was a processional of people bringing their lights and the torches? So that little area there was uh, sort of inspired by that California fires of all things. So, uh, so above that, you can see the angel heralding and hearkening out of heaven that the heavens opened up, that they were actually able to look above and, and see what was happening. Uh, so that's sort of the interpretation there. This top part right here is sort of um, a tribute to my famous, my most famous artist, uh, Michelangelo. And so you can see how they used to, he used to prop up the, the, the apostles and prophets up on in the, in the Sistine Chapel as you look at it. And so this side represents uh, Isaiah propped up in Isaiah 63 and 64. And so pretty much that's the interpretation in a nutshell. There's a different things and different elements in here that you could read into it, but there's a lot of scripture involved here as well. So I'm excited about being here. Thank you so much for allowing me to, to come and, and uh, talk about this. And uh, thank you for coming out. There's a lot of food there, so thank you. Posters for Senate, please stop by the table. And also, there's lots of food. There's lots of food till 6 30. Please go by the table. We have lots of things. And also, take the time to get more acquainted with our artist while he's here and ask him some personal questions and ideas if he has But more than anything, please enjoy. And again, thank you.